Welcome everyone. <laughs> I see this incredibly beautiful mosaic appearing um, before my eyes. And thank you for for joining us this morning and it's a it's a tremendous gift to both yourself and to everyone who is here in the temple. Um, including the trees and the sky and the furniture in your room and the people in the rooms next to you and your neighbors. All one constellation of, of being. I think we'll sit for a couple minutes while people are signing in. great silence of the bell. The temple bell both announcing and singing the silence. as the sound of the bell falls back into the silence. And then whatever else is appearing moves forward into being. And resting in the center of the silence, each, each person, you yourself. Endlessly things appearing from the inner life and the outer life. And there's no difference really. Resting in the center of the silence, you let things be themselves. And in the center of the silence, everything appearing doesn't impinge upon you. And if you feel your life pressing in and impinging upon you, you rest inside of that and let that be here too. The great silence at the center opens out infinitely. Outwardly, there's no end. Inwardly, there's no end. I think a transtromer vault after vault. Inside each person opens out endlessly.
Well, welcome everyone um, to our third in this January series with Tess and Jesse and Michelle and I on the great silence at the beginning. And in a way, um, January has that sense of, of um, this new beginning or this fresh start or in the way every time you sit in meditation it has that same quality of your at the beginning of the universe <laughs> the sense of everything that came before has fallen into abeyance and is no longer from, uh, at play I guess and everything that is about to come has not yet arisen. And there's a sense of, um, uh, I guess, communion with the life that's here, or a sense of receiving and not interfering with anything. For a while, the period of meditation, you let the universe make itself and also destroy itself. <laughs> Whatever it's up to at the moment, um, it's no longer up to you to manage the universe and make it, to pull it into being or shove it out of the way. It's, it's just doing that on its own. And in a way, in the meditation, you begin to get a sense of what it feels like if I weren't trying to um, control the world. And... Uh, the great silence. So it gives us a, a, it allows the universe to appear and also to disappear without um, deciding beforehand what would be good to have come into being or get rid of. The other night, um, I'd been hearing about this green comet. And uh, that I think it was something like the first time, I don't know, some massive, large number, like 50,000 years or something, the first time it's come around. And so a couple of nights ago, we went out to look for it. And I'd heard, I, you know, we, we sort of vaguely had some idea of where it was, but, you know, we thought we knew where it was. But when we got out there, we realized we didn't really know where it was. <laughs> and we also knew you had to have binoculars. So we brought binoculars. It's a beautiful, sparkling, cl clear night, no moon yet. And um, because we, we didn't even know if you could see it or not, that we, we thought, well, we just started looking for it sort of everywhere. And um, this is very much like your own awakening. <laughs> you have some idea of where it's going to come from and what it's going to look like and how you're going to get there how we're going to find this green comet and we start looking at the sky and trying to find it and pretty soon we just kind of get we forget about the green comet because we're looking at the stars in Orion and if you have binoculars suddenly or we're looking at the Pleiades and there's this tremendous um, sense of awe and at the glittering majesty of the universe and and there we had you know there was our morning star with this evening star I and all beings awaken and we didn't need to see the green comet in order for that to happen um, so this morning I was looking for actually where to find the green comet and I looked on this site called Earth Sky where they have very accurate information and they said that tonight there would be um, another celestial event. It would be um, Saturn, uh, it would be Venus, the, the evening and morning star. It would, be sat it would be Venus, the morning star, and it would be right at sunset there would be a conjunction of Venus and Saturn and the new moon. And uh, so tonight, 
<laughs> you can go and look for your own um, morning star, evening star, green comet. So today uh, I want to talk about um, the moments of awakening or where, what is it to have a practice and where, what is the great silence have to do with awakening and meditation, how those are um, related to each other. And also this idea of um, the New Year's resolutions. I, I saw this great thing the other day where it was um, in the New York Times where there was a, a piece on um, awe and some, someone had written, um, it was a professor of, I don't know, professor of neuroscience or something at UC Berkeley, and he'd written a book on, um, it was called The New Science of Everyday, Awe, Awe, <laughs> The New Science of Everyday Wonder and How It Can Transform Your Life. And then it was all these methods of how, um, to evoke intentional awe experiences. <laughs> so, so many of us take up meditation in that kind of spirit of, I'm going to try to, you know, get some awe so that I can, I don't know, be happier or, um, mm, yeah, I guess to be, to have some kind of, I guess to get, to get away from this terrible feeling of, of despair or restlessness or longing or or confusion or fear. Fear is a very is a really large one these days. A lot of sense of fear around. How can it, maybe I can use awe to get rid of this fear? And the story of Buddha, I think, um, is tremendously interesting because it starts with the condition of having achieved, basically it, it starts with the condition of Buddha having achieved all of his New Year's and all of your New Year's resolutions. So he's got the life perfectly down, you know, he's got the beautiful mansion, he's got, you know, his mortgage paid off, he's got a, a, the perfect partner, um, he has a child, he has status, and money so and he's kept and and there's actually oops there's absolutely no sense of um anything unwanted anything that i would feel might be a problem and is excluded and anything that i consider in the realm of desirable has been achieved and he begins there, the story begins there, which is just a beautiful and strange opening to the story of awakening. And in a way, the Buddhist story, it sort of um, describes what it's like to um, the kind of um, sorrow that is the longing that cannot be assuaged by getting things. And I think over and over again, we discover that um, the truth of that. I mean, in very small ways, it can be, you know, I, I think, God, if I, you know, I really want to lose some weight, but there is some vanilla bean ice cream in the freezer right now. And there's also dark chocolate. And there's also almonds and pecans. And if I just put it all in this nice little bowl and um, that will, that will do it. And, and then as I'm putting the ice cream in, I think, I just want a little more. I want a little more. I want more. I want more. <laughs> and there's a part of the mind that um, is just full of this sense of craving that if I can only have more of something, then mm, I guess it's, I don't know what it is. I look inside of myself like, what is that? <laughs> Um, I think it's so that I won't meet the four t 
touch, the four touches that Buddha met. met. And it's all the things that he wanted to keep out. One, you know, um, it was sickness, um, old age, death, and then the the monk, the path, the, the path that there's a way forward. So this is the experience of that intrinsic in every moment is the, the loss of the moment. This kind of um, both the sorrow of um, the inescapable sorrow of things passing, falling back into the great silence. And we so much wish that we could maintain the palace. And so there's that. But there's also you'll discover a tremendous amount of effort is required continually to maintain the sense of, of a separate, safe, and jeweled um, me <laughs> and my life. That you'll find that you'll just, even if it's working, maybe particularly if it's working, that there's um, this uh, continual, let's say you finally achieve the perfect weight, you know, whatever that is for you. Um, maybe you finally gained the 20 pounds that you wanted to because you're struggling with anorexia and you just, the skeletal quality and you finally achieved it or you've lost the 20 pounds that you wanted to lose. And, and then if there's a sense of battling, of, um, of being at war with some part of my life. And you can find that, you know, this is very, um, this is very much a part of the Buddhist story too, that is the second, what he did after he left the palace was he thought, well, I'll just, um, I'll just try to keep out of my own mind anything that I in some way feel is an impediment to my awakening. And that, that will be something different for everyone. For you, it might be, I don't know, if I can just keep this critical mind, you know. I'm always just um, really hostile and critical. Like, I'm always finding fault with everyone. In my job, I'm finding fault with everyone. And even if I don't say it, I'm, I'm feeling it. And so I'm really going to work on my meditation. And what I'll do is I will, I'll just try to, like, calm that part of the mind. I'll like try to extinguish that part of my own experience. I'll wall, but you can see the trouble there and the Buddha discovered this is that you can get really good at that and be outwardly suddenly everyone at work is thinking, oh wow, you know, you're like really, it's like nice to be with you now. You're not so critical and it's not such a, it's not so important. I don't want to get a different shift that I'm not sharing with you. Um, but then there'll be the war just changes the location and there'll be this continual sense of um, needing to control and dampen down the inner life. And so the Buddha discovered, he took that to the sort of the nth degree where there's a kind of starvation. Um, uh, there's a kind of extinguishing of, of life. And in fact, he almost extinguished his own life, which is a, like a beautiful and strange and disturbing image. That that's that he gave us these two sides of the, the path of, of basically of, of control, which is to try to get everything I want in the first one and then it's the second is to try to push everything that I don't want to be here away and that um, you'll find that every any time there's some part of my life that I either inner or outer, and they'll, you'll find that they are corresponding. There's something in the outer world that I, I just can't bear 
to be here. There'll be some inner correspondence in its beautiful symmetry. I think you begin to start to notice that in your own practice, that the meditation gives you another way to be with all of this. It's not the austerities or the getting of things. It's just simply the, the resting and letting our lives act upon us and letting life itself um, change us without us deciding beforehand what we'll look like. Uh, that there's a, a tremendous trust, I think, um, in reality. Um, that's the thing I think that really drew me to the practice of Zen, particularly the way the old Chan masters practiced, which is there wasn't any part of my own life or my own inner experience that was going that I was going to need to have to pretend wasn't there. That there would be no discoveries that I could make that would need to be censored. And simply to feel that in your meditation is to find your own sense of refuge, a place that Jesse described it beautifully last week where he's talking about the great silence in the center the great silence at the beginning is this place of, um, it's actually your fruit of nature. It's, um, it, it's you. It's the sense of, um, uh, there's nothing that can harm it. There's no, and I guess that's the, when I'm saying that there was nothing in myself that I, that I could discover either outwardly or inwardly that couldn't be included. And that's the experience of um, your own nature as being unstained and nothing can harm it. It's not in opposition to anything before I've decided right or wrong is the great silence. So I think that's a good place. We're going to sit for a bit. And the great silence is inside of everything. Like I see someone's, there's a black tail of a cat going across someone's screen. The great silence there, the great silence inside of, at the beginning, inside of everything in your room, outside your house, in your country, in the oceans, in the new moon, in the green comet. We're going to sit. great silence at the beginning. With this morning star, I and all beings awaken.
with this Jordan's music, I and all beings awaken. A great silence at the beginning. With this morning star, I and all beings awaken. Welcome back. <laughs> oh, so beautiful, Jordan. I just did not want that music to end. Um, so I think that sense of, of there's a kind of sweetness too in the um, in the sense of the, of loss, you know, the longing is a kind of sweetness in, in, in every, every experience that the whole amplitude of human experience. I remember speaking to a, um, a couple of friends about this, about how in a way, um, I can remember when my, my beloved cat Alyosha died and I think he was really the first being that I was intimately close with, that I'd walk through every moment of death with, through the getting sick, through the, the terrible chaos of the vet's office, to the being with him, you know, bringing him home and the whole night and the burial and all of that, and how the grief and the sorrow was fitting, and it had a, a flavor and a taste that was nourishing and seemed to make the world wider and more alive in a way. And it seemed to be his final gift to me was the walking through his death with him. So every appearance and disappearance, if we aren't fighting with it, we simply receive it and let it affect us and change us, uh, then we don't need to be afraid of our lives. So with the Buddhist story, we left him, um, he'd, we found him first when he had achieved the perfect life. And then where there was um, the discovery of, I guess, his own sense of that there are Maybe that there's, one can't, there's a sorrow in the separation of the experience of separation that is required to hold myself even in a perfect life. And that is inextricable in that kind of way of being in one's life. And then all of the effort of the austerities and then to the point where he almost left life itself a sense of starvation. And then we come to his um, Buddha's Enlightenment night, which I was reading the story the other day and I love the image of when he um, he comes to the, the Bodhi tree and he he tries to sit on the various sides of it, on the west side, on the south side, on the north side, and it tips into hell and there's no, there's no sense of rest and stability. And then he, he sits in the side facing east, facing, um, I don't know, I guess it's facing the great silence and the, the life 
appearing and he finds the place that doesn't move, the immovable seat. I think that's another way of describing the sitting, your sitting meditation, that you can feel it formally when you sit, but you can feel it any time you rest in the center of the silence, that it's an immovable seat. And it's not like um, it comes from being strong or being invincible it itself is like it's like the the, the center of the where the, the universe is spinning around it's immovable because it lets everything move <laughs> I guess that's how you could describe it it lets everything move around it and therefore it's the center and it's immovable so that night he sits he finds a seat that does not move and Mara appears. And I think this is a beautiful image of what a practice is, where in the story of Buddha, Mara appears, you could say it's his own mind that um, is it was beautifully, um, Mara in the story is everything that the Buddha himself would be afraid of or would be seduced by or would be um, anything you would try to hold off or try to get, Mara is offering. And you can feel that in your own mind when you sit in meditation that there will be currents of feeling tone of the emotional body. There'll be um, images rising up to pull you one direction or another. Images to frighten you, images to um, promises of power, <laughs> promises of love, whatever your mind is doing, you know, uh, pay your mortgage off or whatever the thing is that it's offering you or frightening you with hurling spears of, oh God, you gotta, you know, you gotta pay off that student debt or you have to make that phone call to your sister who's, whatever your mind is doing, um, that's Buddha's mind. And you're sitting in the seat that does not move, the immovable seat of your own being. And every person that's here has a sense of that. If you're here, you know about this. And in some traditions, I've heard the story told that somehow there's a sense that he's not affected by it, but that's not the Chan understanding of it. It's that all of those feelings, the, the seductions and the, and the fear and the longing and the grief and the loss is passing through the Buddha unimpeded. He's no longer afraid of the feelings, the images, the um, parts of his past or his future or his present. Nothing in the world is he's at war with. He's no longer at war with his life. And then his life can pass through him and change him. And then he's not afraid, and you are not afraid of that territory as you move through your life. And the more you practice, the wider the sense of freedom and ease inside yourself, it enlarges. And other people can feel this when you're with them, and you yourself can feel it. And I mean, that's the image of the Bodhisattva. The Bodhisattva is no longer um, afraid of the life appearing. So you yourself know about this way of being. So he sits all night and uh, just as you sit all night, every time you sit, even if it's for one minute, it's all night. <laughs> it's the whole of night. It's the whole of your life. 
every moment that you sit. And you yourself are um, discovering awakening. And in the morning, um, he looks up as dawn's coming on and he sees the morning star. And he says, he cries out, with this morning star. And I, I love that it's Venus, you know, the morning star Venus. There's something about that too, about the goddess of love that is the, the morning star. The, the brightest um, celestial body, except for the sun, is the um, Venus. And with this morning star, I and all beings, I and all beings awaken. And it's not that all beings now are purified. <laughs> they are themselves. They're allowed to become fully themselves and be in the moment of their own transformation of awakening. And they may be, and this is true, so your awakening is not a, a, like a linear trajectory where you go through all these steps, you awaken, and then you're always, you know, awaken. You'll find that throughout each day, each moment, you know, it's this elliptical movement through being caught in your own um, hell realms. And then some piece of the universe will step forward and it won't come from your own good intentions or your own efforts. You'll hear a bird call, or you'll notice the sunlight on a leaves shimmering, and then you'll be back. And at this point, that's the moment when you, your practice comes in. And those are moments of awakening. Like this morning, I was, sometimes I really like to, right before I give a talk, once I've done all the preparation and, um, you know, I make like reams and reams on piles of notes and then I just have to sift through them the day before and um, or that morning and then slowly everything gets sort of winnowed down to a, a couple of pages of material. I have to write things really big with a thick uh, sharpie pen because my, my eyesight's not that great and then I, d I may not even check my notes but just to know that I can check my notes and actually read them. And so I've got all this settled, and then there's a feeling of, um, I just need to feel the earth. And in a way, that was a moment in um, the Buddha's awakening night where he reaches down and he touches the earth. And that's where you can like, um, you can trust the moment that you're in, you can reach and touch the carpet or you can look at the sky, let the earth touch you. So I lay down on the carpet. I was, I don't know, not really worrying, but just sort of agitated, <laughs> like slightly sick to my stomach, but, um, and feeling like I'd really like to not be sick to my stomach. And so I'm lying down at, I, look outside and there's just in the top of a eucalyptus tree behind the house and some pipes that are sticking up and some electrical wires running through the sky. And there's this bit of the eucalyptus tree that there's something about the leaves where they, I think they have some kind of oil on them or something, but they, certain lights, they catch the light and they are um, like they've been gilded with with just like this, with, with gold leaf, as if they have gold leaf and they're shimmering in the light. And I, it was the morning star with this morning star. And it's a sense of the separate me that has trouble and could do it right or wrong. I could, there's something to gain or something to lose. All of that falls into abeyance. And there's a sense of, of um, being held 
inside the world. There's a sense of sense of the sense of communion. I think of the actual communion. Um, I was raised Catholic, and there's this wonderful ritual where they place the host, the little piece of um, unleavened bread, on your tongue, and then it, you're so not allowed to chew it. You're supposed to let it dissolve in your mouth, and it's that sense of, and then it's Christ's body. It's it's supposed to actually be the living body of Christ that then dissolves inside of you in a way that's very much like the the same image of with this host, with this morning star, I and all beings, a sense of myself and others dissolves. I want to read you a poem. This is um, to give you a, a feel for this is just like it's just everywhere <laughs> in human experience. It's not a, something that the Buddhists discovered or have a kind of cornered market on. It's intrinsic to human experience and this is a poem I really love. It's by Wordsworth and it's, um, I just, I, I love this poem and I, I was reading about it the other day and I discovered this. It's called, I'm Composed Upon Westminster Bridge, September 3rd, 1802. And he was, I found out it was, he was on his way to, um, well, in his youth, when he was a, a student at Cambridge, during the summer, the first summer, he just hated Cambridge and he just was a pretty terrible student and he just wanted to get out of there. So he decided to go on a walking tour of Europe and he went to um, the Swiss Alps and he's walking through the Swiss Alps and being Wordsworth, he, he's really not paying much attention. And the next thing you know, he walks into the French Revolution. <laughs> And there's all this chaos and turmoil around him. And he ends up going back to Cambridge, being changed by that. And then the following summer, he goes back to, directly to France. And there he falls in love with a French woman. And she gets pregnant. And he stays there for a couple of months. There's all these stories about how they tried to get married and then being the French Revolution, they weren't able to work this out. And he goes back to France and he goes on with his life and that there's this turmoil in the countries and he can't get back and she can't get there. And he eventually um, falls in love with another woman. So the woman, the French woman, Annette, he, she has a daughter that's Wordsworth, illegitimate daughter. And he's on his way, September 3rd, 1802, to go meet his daughter, Caroline, for the first time. And he's going to cross the English Channel with his sister, Dorothy. And on their way to go to the boat to cross the Channel, they're on Westminster Bridge, and they have this kind of epiphany of like, seeing the morning star. And I think it's no accident that the epiphany came to him when he was able to turn towards the east, turn towards a part of his life which had been excluded, and to go and meet his daughter. And here it is. Earth has not anything to show more fair Dull would be, dull would he be of soul, who could pass a sight so touching in its majesty. This city now doth, like a garment, wear the beauty of the morning, silent, bare. Ships, towers, domes, theaters, and temples lie open unto the fields and to the sky all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. Never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendor, valley, rock, or hill. Never saw I, never felt a calm so deep. The river glideth 
at his own sweet will. And that's where he's letting things be themselves. The universe is not trying to control anything. The river glideth at his own sweet will. Dear God, the very houses seem asleep. And all that mighty heart is lying still. So I think that's a good place we'll sit. I want to read you two more poems. One's very short, one's a little longer. And then I'd like to hear from a few friends. Um, this one just came, I just came over the transom this morning and it's by a poet that I'd never heard of. His name is Alfred Kramborg and he wrote poetry about a hundred years ago and this was from 1916. And it's a wonderfully ambiguous, but it goes into the territory of, I think, that Wordsworth was in, which is the sense of retribution and blame, self-blame or other blame. Um, finding fault is, is the, if anything, will, is a kind of impediment to um, the feeling of war. I guess that's what holds in place the feeling of separation is this um, condemnation of some portion of reality. And this is called Dance. Um, and also it's about the moon because um, we've got this beautiful crescent moon to look forward to tonight with Venus and Saturn in conjunction. Dance. Moon dance. You were not to blame, nor you, lovely white moth. But I saw you together. <laughs> and then this one is, um, it speaks again, this is by um, Tennyson, Alfred Lord Tennyson, and it's, it's called Marriage Morning, and it it speaks to that, I guess you would say that Buddha's enlightenment morning when he saw the morning star, that's his marriage morning, the, the morning of, of joining together with, with the universe. And there's a word in here that, I, um, that he uses, which I didn't know what it meant, so I looked it up. It's style, S-T-I-L-E, S, the styles. And they are apparently, there are a set of steps two or three or four steps that go between fields. They go over a fence or they go over a um, rock wall that bring you from one place to another. So it's this transition place. It's a, I guess it's a stepping through a gate, a portal. It's called Marriage Morning. Light so low upon earth, you send a flash to the sun. And here is the golden close of love. All my wooing is done. All the effort is done. <laughs> all my wooing is done. Oh, all the woods and the meadows, woods where we hid from the wet, styles where we stayed to be kind, meadows in which we met. Light so low in the veil, you flash and lighten afar, for this is the golden morning of love, and you are her morning star. Flash, I am coming, I come by meadow and style and wood. O oh, lighten into my eyes and my heart, into my heart and my blood. Heart, you are great enough. Are you great enough for a love that never tires, heart? Are you great enough for a love that never tires? Are you afraid of this happiness? Oh heart, are you great enough for love? I have heard of thorns and briars. Over the thorns and briars. Over the meadows and the stiles. So here is including everything. The thorns, the briars. Over the world. To the end of it, flash of a million miles. 
So there's Tennyson's Awakening Poem. And uh, I think now I'd like to hear from my co-conspirators, um, Tess or Michelle, do you have anything to say? I'll say something. Um, I love the, the line you said earlier about uh, bodhisattvas aren't afraid to let life appear. And I was noticing, um, particularly today as Jordan was playing, the way in which he was so intimately informed by what kept appearing. Like it wasn't that he was um, making the music. It was that there was, it felt like as if, as I was listening to it, this conversation was happening and he was making space for what might appear and sort of listening to it and then allowing it to come into form and kind of responding to it. And then there were moments where there'd be that great silence again and space to listen for what might appear and it just kept going on. And it feels like a lot of what you've been saying today now I notice it in my own life is when I can make space to be informed by what appears without thinking, oh, I don't know if um, something comes through my own heart that I think, oh, no, not that. Um, that I can just listen to it and let it play out to see what actually is trying to be heard and try to let it out into things and respond before I... Um, I'm so sure it's not part of the song in a way. And I was also remembering um, one time I visited India and I was I got to see a rug making factory. And someone was explaining to me that each rug has a song that the maker sings. Each rug has its own song that they play as they go along. So each stitch and color and pattern has a note in the song and how um, in a way that appearing that every single note has a place in the rug um, has to have its spot. So yeah, I like all that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's beautiful. That um, we often feel that something is an impediment to my awakening, that my, my greed or my grief or my um, rage or whatever it is, and I just need to get rid of this. And in the Buddha's awakening night, it's this experience of that it's holding, it is my, it's not an impediment to my awakening, it's my awakening appearing in its dark form. And to be able to taste it and have it, and if I think it's an impediment to, as you say, we can't let it, we, it has something for us. We don't know what it is. And uh, I love that about Jordan's notes that I feel that too. Letting the silence be um, the source of the next note. Michelle. Hi. That's a... Uh, uh, that sense, I love it when it's possible to be in that place where you're just letting things arise and sort of seeing what happens. And I've been thinking today, listening to you of how uh, in my family and for me, one of the things that gets, feels like it gets in the way of that is a strong desire to be uh, competent and uh, on top of things and uh, smart and things like that. And um, that's another way of sort of trying to control how I think things should be. And a couple of things came to my mind. Um, one of them is, well, so this morning I was talking to some friends and somebody was talking about how they're sort of staggering to their feet at the beginning of the year, you know, and, but they were, they felt like they were getting there. And it, it gave me an image right away of myself who also I feel like I'm staggering and I thought, Oh, but I don't feel anywhere near being on my feet. Like I'm so staggering. And, but just simply by having a conversation about it and giving it a name and having an image, it let me 
enjoy my sense of staggering more than I'm tending to. And I had this image of like being on a tennis court and instead of returning all the balls with great uh, aplomb and, you know, I was just sort of like, oh, sh there goes one. Oh, darn, there goes one. And and yet somehow I had some compassion for that part of me. And, um, and so I thought that's like, that's a thing. Like if you just can get sort of an image and name it and then it helps the judgment go away. And then the other thing, though, so my dad is uh, pretty elderly. He also comes from this family that like, never wants to be stupid and wants to be competent and all of this. Uh, I know nobody else has this experience, but uh, just my family. Uh, but anyway, he's uh, he's had some issues with his cognitive abilities for a while, but then he got COVID at the end of last year. And that really, really... Um, put things in a new place. And now it's really hard for him uh, to do really basic things. Um, he can't, like he looks at all his medications on a table and he's like, he's no idea what to do with them. He can't remember that his phone has volume uh, and, and that's why he can't hear the ringer because he's turned the volume down, you know, really kind of basic things like whose laundry is that and who was here yesterday. But it's not as though all of his, he's not gone. He's still him. And the challenge of being in that place where you can't do something that it looks so much like you should be able to do. It's been really interesting for me to watch him handle that and meet that and going back and forth between the kind of welcoming, like, this is what's happening. This is me. I am this person who can't do this incredibly basic thing that I've been able to do my whole life. And what do I do with that? Um, and sometimes he goes to the place of blame or anger or what do I, you know, you're making me feel bad. It's you, you know, but a lot of times he doesn't. And I've been really impressed. Um, at his ability to meet what's happening and let it in and just be like, wow, I'm grateful I've got some help. I think I could do this, but I recognize finally, okay, I'm not doing it. And maybe, you know, I get to spend a little time with my daughter and that's a nice thing. And that's it. like, that's, those things we really don't want to meet. That's what it's really these really, we really don't like that, like being demented and not having our mind and not have, being able to do the things we think we should do. But that's, that's where I keep meeting it. Like if I can say, I, maybe I'm not the thing I want to be and a competent, smart, whatever person. And if I can meet that, I don't know, that's, it's just, like for my dad and I, when he does that, there's space for us to be together and we can be closer. And it's a big deal. So those things have been coming to my mind listening to you today. Oh, thank you. I think the thing that uh, the image that came to mind is Buddha in his austerities being defeated. That, that tremendous effort that the self, um, I want to be a good person. I want to be a good daughter. And this is what a good daughter does is... And the way being defeated um, is a promising moment where we're either so exhausted or you know, trying to keep this marriage going and finally the person leaves us. And there's some sense of resting, that's the touching the ground moment, where we touch the ground where we are, where, um, what would it be like? What what is it like? What is it like? <laughs> what is it like if I'm not trying to get to a different or better or maintain the sense of myself or my life? Right. Then That's you've the, just got what's here, right? And it's interesting with the with your father where I noticed that with my own mother where sometimes um, the thing that they most, my mother would be the person who would, she said this numerous times, Deeply, she would never want to be around if she didn't have full, full access to her intellectual capabilities. 
and she hasn't had that for a number of years now. And the more they were stripped away, in a way, the more intimacy was possible. And and she was no longer holding me off and holding people off. And so we don't know what our lives will, what will come next and how they will change us. But I think like with the Bodhisattva, the feeling that we always have some refuge that is our essential home. And it doesn't require any work other than, that. it doesn't require any work. <laughs> Um, let's see, Jordan, do you have anything to say since we've been talking about you and your music? I've been thinking about this song lately <clears throat> by a guy named, written by a guy named Shane McGowan, who is the front man for the Pogues, um, notorious front man for the Pogues. Um, but the song's called A Rainy Night in Soho. And for some reason, it's just been in my head, like every day I wake up and it's there. Um, just this morning when I was coming out to, to sit here, um, one of the lines of the song is, On a rainy night in Soho, the wind was whistling all its charms. Um, and I opened the, the back door of my house and the wind just blasted my face. And it was frigid and like knives. But for some reason it like coincided perfectly with when that line was happening in my head. Um, and it just felt like, yeah, there, the wind is whistling all its charms right there. Um, and I just let it. And in that, um, it's like that song and me and the wind were all just right there. Um, and I didn't have to do anything. And that, um, I guess in some way that's sort of like how the music happens. Like the, I don't have to do anything. The wind just blows and there's the music. And all I have to do is kind of just be there for it to show up. Out of the great silence, great silence in the beginning. Marion, I'm not sure how to, if I can, there we go. Do you have anything to say on the East Coast? Uh -huh. oh, thanks. Um, while you were talking, I, I was feeling how accessible the silence is sometimes. Um, if I slow down is a good time when I, I feel there's that, that little slit of space kind of opens up and um, yeah, there's space. Tess had said there's more space. And when Jordan plays his music or, or some music or something beautiful is happening, this morning I felt that silence when he was playing his music. It was so simple to just be there with nothing else, just that. Um, this morning my granddaughter came into my room and with some books and wanted to read. And we, you know, she said, give me a place to sit. And we we got in bed together and and it was that same thing of just, just that, it was just that, and it was so wonderful. But I think the space that's made also allows for the things that aren't so wonderful to be able to also find, find that silence and that space in those two. Um, just having the experience of the space and the silence has some kind of place to experience all of it, <laughs> not just the wonderful things. Thank you, Alison. <laughs> Molly in Southern California, what, is, what does the silence sound like from there? Um, yeah, so it was interesting while we were meditating I was having that sense of spaciousness, but I felt like I was having a lot of physical change to accommodate it. I don't really know how to describe it, but I thought if I was a deck of cards that needed shuffled for the next round of the game, that's what was happening in, in my whole being. So I just sat there and experienced it. I don't really know what it was, but it was very interesting and 
I do have like a, a physical sense of spaciousness that is different for me. Mm. Well, thank you. That's a beautiful image of the, the deck of cards rearranging the order. And that's this, I remember the sound as a kid, the sound of the cards and the feeling of the air rushing through of this. It's a, mm. it's a feeling of the not knowing being um, uh, coming into form. Uh, it's, kind of, it's really wonderful. Yeah, and it was physically uncomfortable, but it didn't have anything to do with unwellness or anything like that. It was some, yeah, reshuffling. It was really interesting. Well, thank you. And Michelle and Tess, any final words before we close? No? <laughs> All right. Um, next week, we have uh, one final Sunday of uh, Michelle and Tess and Jesse and Allison will be there um, in the final Sunday for the silence, great silence. And uh, thank all of you for coming. And um, let's have uh, Amaryllis and Jordan take us out. Thank you, Jordan. So beautiful. Thank you, Amaryllis. 
for taking us out and thank you everyone who came today um it's it means a lot to everyone else that you're here and holding the temple and being a part of the community